A lot is going on in the world, isn't it? Some might say it's never been like this before. It's just not true. We really are dealing with issues, and Paul is writing to this church at Rome, telling Christians they're in the midst of a struggle, but God is in that struggle with them. So as they're walking along, they are to think of themselves as representatives of Jesus Christ. Over the past several weeks, we've been looking at, actually months, we've been walking through the book of Romans. Chapter 3, he says, everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sounds pretty desolate. In chapter 4, he said, there's something happened. Righteousness was given. How was it given? By faith. Well, why was it given? Because of the great need that you had. Chapter 5, he explains, it's one man, Adam, sinned and everyone dies. But one man died, that's Jesus. Everyone can live. He's writing to Christians, telling them about this. In chapter 6, he describes how that happened. Don't you know, as many of us as were baptized into Christ, he explains that again. And then he says, now you have to think of yourself as a new creature, not an old creature. Present yourself as a person who is a person of obedience. Chapter 7, he confesses or admits the things that he wants to do as a Christian, he doesn't do. And the things that he doesn't want to do, those are the things that he does. Or at least everyone, if you don't believe that thought, you believe everyone in the Old Testament never could keep up the law. So it was a problem. What, what's the solution? Chapter 8 starts off with, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ. It ends with, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Well, it sounds like he just needs to say, uh, signed sincerely, Paul, and leave it. But he doesn't. He goes on in chapters 9 through 11 to get even more complicated in the way he describes the relationship. And he talks about what it's like to be a Jew in that situation. He's a Jew himself. He's given the reasons for this. And so what are we to do? Paul is in the midst of talking about something very challenging. And I think what we would say in our time is what can a caring person do? We're not in the first century. We're in the 21st century. So what does a caring person do in our time? Worldwide, look around. Countries are not getting along. What's happening in Ukraine? Why would the Russians do this? Why would God allow this to happen? What's happening in Israel? Why is Israel not being protected by God? And why are the Palestinians being overrun by the Israelis? What's the situation? Where is God when this happens? Then you look at our nation. Why are we having protests? Why are we talking about the war? I thought these were peaceful protests. Why is there violence? The why question keeps coming up. Do we have answers? Yes, we have answers. Well, why doesn't the church talk about this? Now, this is the issue that I want to get to because I have heard all of my life people talk about, well, when I was young, the church never talked about, well, who was the church where you were when you were young? And maybe they were talking about it and you didn't hear it. Today is a day of graduation. We're at least celebrating our graduating seniors. And so tonight, even, we're going to get even more focused. But I think we underestimate not only our teens, but our young people. I think I was underestimated. I think you've probably been underestimated. The power of the church is magnificent and the power can be shown tonight. Today, in fact, I want to ask, I want to ask someone, someone to help me here to demonstrate something. These teens over here on the front row, would you help me in just a way that's kind of odd? I'm going to give you some fruit. Just, whoa, whoa, whoa. Just take, Carter, thank you. Just hang, hang it. I want you to get an orange and then pass it on. Everyone get an orange. When it gets down to Joe, Joe, if you'd bring that basket right back here and set it at the top. So just get an orange, hold it. Very important. This is going to be important because I think there's something that we can learn about the intellect of a teen. And we have a great group. We not only graduate our graduating seniors this year, we've also introduced some sixth graders uh, that are now in the youth group. Isn't that great? Welcome. They're sharp too. I've always thought we've had sharp people. But someone would say, well, the church did something. Thank you, Joe. 
just lay it there to be great. We'll come back to that in a minute. So just hold on. Those aren't real oranges, so don't peel it. Just hold on to it. I want to get those back um, in just a minute. But sometimes when you're talking about what's going on in the world, it's a hard thing to talk about. And the issues I mentioned are real. For example, people are saying, this is terrible. We're having riots. I happen to be in sixth grade when Detroit had their riots in 1967. We had moved out of Detroit. We were in the inner city. We moved out to a little community of about six or 7,000. I remember when people were running up and down the streets saying, there are busloads of people coming out here and they're all out after you. And we were afraid. We ran home, what is happening? Our world is falling apart. That's why a person from Detroit would love 68 World Series when the Tigers won. It was something that was good that finally happened to our city. That's why no one can forget it. If you talk to someone that was alive at that time, you'll appreciate it. What do we do now though? What is the issue? I would say, think before we act. You may not know all the information. Think before you act. In any realm, someone talks about the church. The church has never been in as much disarray. That's just not true. Read your Bible. God's people have always struggled with whether to do the right thing or whether to do the wrong thing. Think before you act. Make sure you are correct. Make sure that what you believe is the Word of God. And I'm going to move rather uh, rapidly this morning, but I want you to follow in Romans chapter 9 because here's my plea, and I would make the plea to every teen here and to every adult, don't let others lead you astray. When people say, the church didn't say anything. Yes, they did. But I can remember in 67, when we went back to church, people weren't talking about what was happening downtown. What they were talking about was trust in the Lord and do good. Stay with the Lord. That's the basic foundational principle. People have asked me, what are you going to talk about during the election year? You know what I'm going to talk about? Trust in the Lord. Do good. You can divide over political issues if you want to, but who are you going to side with? If we're going to go to Israel, who are you going to side with? Are you going to side with the state of Israel or the Palestinians? Has, is either group perfect? Is either group monolithic? In other words, are they all thinking the same thing? I would say, think before you act. Make sure you're correct before you reach a decision, and then pray to the Lord. People are doing that. I'm glad. Yesterday I was in a funeral service that we had for uh, Jim Beck. It wasn't everyone, it was the family coming together. Thought it was a beautiful service. I guess in some ways I represented many people because I said, if many people could be here, they would be here. But it was good for that family to come together. And I sat and listened to those issues. One of our brothers came up to me, showed me his phone. He said, and showed me that scripture, that trust in Lord. Where is that found? He knew, but he's asking me. I said, Proverbs chapter 3. He said, look, Daddy, said, I read that every day. Read that every day. That's what we need to do. Go back to the Bible. Talk about what the Bible says. Well, why is that important? Listen to what Paul says. Let's just look at those verses again. If you want to look at the Bible, this is the way to start it. Let's just look and say, what does this really mean? And I'm not talking about, did you read Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 6 or 1 through 8? Is that, is that it, just reading? No, what does he say? And as you read it, each time you read it, I'm saying you'll see in, with new clarity what it's saying and also how to apply it. For example... I speak in truth, or rather, I speak in Christ, Paul says. I'm not lying. My conscience confirms it. I can't get past the first phrase. I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. I have taught our children. You know, I still try to get in some things every once in a while, but they're grown and parents of their own. But I remember when my daughter was young, she would say, listen, I'm not going to lie. I'm going to tell you the truth. And I said, Beth, don't say that. Don't say I'm not going to lie. That just assumes that you've been lying to me the whole time. You know, let's just, just make it, it. It's really not a good thing. Just say the truth all the time. And I would correct her several times. I was thinking I'm the noble father doing what he's doing. I'm correcting my children. And then she was reading the Bible aloud and all of a sudden, whoa, 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 what does that say? And she read it. 
He said, I speak the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. Who said that? And I said, well, you know, I started laughing because I'd never seen it. I'd read it. I'd preached from it, but I'd never really thought about it. Paul said something really, and I had to apologize, and I'm still apologizing because she, she still brings it up, you know, in not a negative way, but it's kind of a good way. I'm not lying. Paul says, my conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. He's an inspired apostle. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Paul says this, this great leader of God. Why? For I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Have you ever stopped to think about that? That word when he says cursed is anathema. Wish I could be sent to hell for my people. And he says, I could. He's not going to do that. But what he is saying is it wouldn't work. You can't suffer for someone so that they will be saved. God gave all of us this issue. Now, why is that a, a difficult passage for me? Because, listen, just think about this. I'll share my dilemma. Jesus went to the cross. He gave himself to die, but he knew that he was going back to be with the Father. He knew he was coming up and he's going to be with the Father. But what I'm hearing Paul say is, I could wish that I was going to hell for my family. Now, what would be sad would be for a person to say, I'm going with my family wherever they go. And if they go to hell, I'm going with them. I think that's a sad thing because we should know better. So he says, I could do that. Those are my own race. He's talking about Israelites. He's talking about being a Jew. And he says, the people of Israel, which brings up an issue that we're dealing with. Theirs is, and he lists all the privileges that those of the Jewish faith had. Theirs is the adoption to sonship. God chose them, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You could just leave, adopted them. I am going to work through you. We're introduced to the Abraham's family. His uh, story goes throughout the rest of the Bible. There's the divine glory. God was working through them. The covenants. Covenants were made to Noah. Covenants were made with Abraham. Covenants were made with Moses. And the idea was you keep your part and I'll do my part. That's a covenant. A covenant comes from God who is able to do something we can't do. So it's not an agreement we make with God. We have nothing to offer. He has the ability to save us. That's what a covenant is. We have the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. He's talking now about the introduction of the New Covenant. The receiving of the law, that is getting Moses going up on Mount Sinai and receiving the law given to him from God and passed along to God's people, telling them what it would be like to prepare themselves to accept Jesus the Christ. It's the tutor, the spiritual tutor to bring us to Christ. And the temple worship, that was a Jewish thing. The temple worship. You might say that the temple worship, here's Old Testament worship and here is New Testament worship, and they compared. They don't compare without getting into too many details. It's like comparing apples and oranges. It's not the same. You say, well, they came together. They didn't come together like we come together. The priests did all the work. Just read the Old Testament. The priests did all of the work. They were the ones that killed the animals. They were the ones that offered the animals. The Levites were the ones who were singing, not all the Levites, it was the male Levites, and only those who could sing well. So you can't just say, here's Old Testament worship, here's New Testament worship, with a few little tweaks to it. No, it's not that simple. Got to go back. And he says, and the promises, the promises were given to my people. Theirs are the patriarchs. So Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they're great, they're wonderful, and they started this process. And from them is traced the human ancestry it's a this is the human lineage of the messiah who is the jesus christ who is the christ the anointed savior and who is god over all forever praised amen so be it that's quite a statement see in chapter 9 he starts off with something that's profound and this is it chapter 11 he ends with something that's profound it's the basic summation of everything that he has said. It's a great passage. Well, what's he talking about? Well, is he talking about this next passage? He says, it's not as though God's word had failed. Where did that come from? Well, he just said, there are the patriarchs, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah. 
the Messiah, who is God over all, forever praised. It's not as though God's word had failed. For not all who are descended from Israel are Israel. And this is where we need to see what helps us understand what's going on in the world today. Nor because they are descendants, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. He's talking about something more than physical. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. When you read the Bible, you'll see what Paul is trying to say. I could die for all my Jewish friends, but the only way they're going to do that is to become a Christian. I've talked to you about the beauty that you have in that you're a Christian, he says to the church at Rome. But if they're counting on being a descendant of Abraham, if they're counting on being uh, Abraham's children, it will not help them. He said, it's through Isaac that your offspring is born. In other words, it's not the children by physical descent who are God's children. It's the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. In our day, I've heard so many people say, we can't hurt Israel, the state of Israel. That's God's people. Think again, think again. That's physical. That's the physical state, the lineage of Abraham. But there's something different about the spiritual side of, of, um, uh, of Israel. In fact, if you read Joshua 21, when they say God's promises, God's promised them that land. That land's not promised them now. In Joshua 21, Joshua, remember, is a captain of Moses' army, and he leads them into the land of Israel, and he is displacing all of those people. Why is God displacing those people? Because they were filled with people who were worshiping idols. And those idols had ways that the, the foreign gods had ways that you would worship them. And part of them would include sexual immorality, which was popular with the people, and it was unacceptable to God. And they were also offering their children as sacrifices for their own lives, their benefits. And that's what God would say. I'd never ask anyone to do that. That's not what you do. So he's now going to displace them. He's giving them the land. So the Lord gave Israel all the land which he had sworn to give their fathers, and they possessed it and lived in it. And the Lord gave them rest on every side, according to all they did sworn to their fathers. And no one of all their enemies stood before them. The Lord gave all their enemies into their land. Not one of the good promises which the Lord had made to the house of Israel failed. All came to pass. It was done. They had the land. Why did they lose the land? because they disobeyed God, and because they disobeyed him, then that land was taken away. But they had it, the promises were kept. But now when you look at what's happening in the state of Israel, you're looking at a nation formed in 1948, made up of the physical remnants or the physical lineage of Israel. So before someone says, that's God's people, it's not spiritual Israel, it's secular Israel, it's the state of Israel. It's nationalistic Israel. Well, who's, who's innocent in all these? I would say, if you look at the actions, both of them are guilty. Both have made mistakes. Do I pray for peace? Absolutely. I pray for peace in China. I pray for peace in Israel. I pray for peace in Ukraine. I pray for peace in America. But I understand we're, we're not a nationalistic church. We're a group of people, many of whom choose to be a part of God's kingdom. What happened then to biblical Israel? Well, Galatians chapter 3 tells us, Paul says, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Not according to law anymore, now it's faith. Faith, what does that mean? Believing and acting on that belief. So if you read something, you believe it, you'll show your faith if you do it. Abraham was told, get up and go. Where am I going to go? I'll tell you later, just go. He got up and went. And because of that, he was shown, and he was shown acceptance, and he was accredited with righteousness. Paul says to this group, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So if you have faith, you're going to be baptized into Christ. And Romans 6 says that's the point at which you became a new creature. You were becoming a new creature as you came out of that watery grave. So all of you who were baptized into Christ 
have put on Christ. It's a beautiful thought. Put him on in Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. Now, I'll stop here. Does that mean when I became a Christian, I'm no longer Jewish? Or when I'm a Christian, I'm no longer Greek? Well, you know better than that. They're still Jewish. There's a lineage. There's a history. They still physically are Jewish, but you can be a Jewish Christian. You could be a Greek Christian. But we're all the same. Jews aren't closer to the Lord than Greeks are. The, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. So if you just look at it, you'll see that everyone... We're all the same. Status-wise, we're the same. Different responsibilities because God has given us different gifts. There is neither slave nor free man. Some might have thought, and some did apparently think. When I became a Christian, I'm no longer a slave. And that's why Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and said, no, if, if you're in a city, you come in the, in the way in which you were called. You stay there. Now, if you can get your freedom, get your freedom. But if not, you're not just running away. You have responsibilities. That's what he's talking about. But there's no status between a slave or a free man. We would say now, or at least I would say, there's no status change between a person, regardless of his educational accomplishments or his business accomplishments. You could be the president or the owner or whatever you want to call of your business, or you could be a corporate executive president over all the corporation, well, you're no more important in the sight of God than that person, and I have to be careful how low I go, but I'm just going to say, because I used to serve in this role when I was going to college in the summers, coming back to get work, I was an assistant to the custodian, a custodian's helper. If I were to be, get an upgrade, I would have been a custodian. Now, I don't think custodians are bad. I think they're great. We need them. And I was one. I was not even a custodian. I was a custodian's helper, which mean, meant when he was mopping and he needed a bucket of water, it was my job to go change the water, go change it, bring it back so he could do more mopping and I could do the vacuuming and we just made it through. It's, but in the sight of God, we're all at the same level. If you start putting yourself up and saying, well, I'm really a corporate guy, realize you're just a servant. It's all you are. It's all we, any of us is. We're just a servant. There is no difference between a slave or a free. I don't have to work anymore. Oh, no. That's when you have to work for the kingdom now. It's kingdom work. God knows what you're doing. There is neither male nor female. We have a problem with that. I'm telling you, we, it's not that we change. We're no longer a male or female. Everyone's the same. No, we're different. Absolutely different. So we're still male, we're still female, we're just a baptized believer, we're a Christian man, Christian woman. And you start putting it before God, it's not talking about a role, it's a status level. So we have different roles. And still, a man is not closer to God than a woman is. Uh, and a woman is not closer to God than a man is. Here is a Mother's Day coming up, and that's great. She is great. She's done tremendous things. Let's give her a praise. But there's a Father's Day coming up. Let's talk about the responsibilities and say, listen, fathers have, have a role in that as well. So all of us are supposed to be doing something. We're, we're all the same. And even in the church, someone say there's neither male nor female. It doesn't matter what you're doing in the kingdom. That's not what the Bible says. So you have to take it to the Bible. In fact, when you talk about elders, can, can a woman, if you really want to get an application to it, can a woman be an elder? Well, let's see. She has to be the husband of one wife. Well, we'll just change what husband means. Now you're really playing with, it, with God's word. And I would say, surely we know the difference. Surely we know what this word means. So he's talking about you are all one in Christ in status. We're all one. We're unified in Christ and each one of us, we don't pray through a priest. We don't go through anyone else. We go to God ourselves because Jesus is our high priest and he's taking us to the Father. If you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. And do my actions really matter? Here's where I want to end and focus on. Do my actions really matter? I want to say that they do. Actions do matter. If we are Abraham's offspring, because you think of it this way, the only way to God is through Jesus. That's the only way. You can't get there any other way. You say, well, I'm going to come. You just can't. It's the only one that gives us. The Bible tells us that, and the Bible reveals God's will. 
When you read your Bible, you're going to find out what it says. And if you just listen, you'll probably do it. It's probably something so simple that we could all do if we just would. Because God keeps his promise. And I would say what we need to do is realize, you know, the word is not difficult to understand. Let me demonstrate that. I think this is probably important. Maybe you'll help. I'm going to ask each one of you, if you would, I ask you just to get, just to get an orange. I'd like to collect my orange back. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. 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 Outstanding. Every one of them said, gave me what I asked for. When you get what you're asked for, I'm going to tell you there's a reward for it. I'd like to give you a lot. The only thing I can give you is a million dollars. And I'm going to give you a million dollars. And uh, this, the church didn't pay for this. I'm telling you, it came out of my, this is a week's salary right here, a million dollars for just doing what you uh, ask. And I would just do that. Someone's going to go home and say, no, they were, uh, they paid people to sit on the front row. Well, $10,000 right here. I was looking over here counting and seeing how many we had. We've got two more, Joe. I'm not going to leave you out. Will. And if we'd had more, I was ready to go all the way up to 20, but we didn't get everyone on the front row. So I've got some more for you all. And uh, my point is this. Why did they do that? Because they only took oranges. You know what I had in this? Joe, you even gave it back to me. I didn't have anyone, and I was thinking about this. Anyone who picked an apple might have said, I like apples. Someone who picked a lemon might have said, I like lemons, could have said that. Let me show you what I think. I think this applies. When I read the Bible, what are we supposed to do in worship? When we're singing, we're to sing. Well, the Lord didn't say, as I've had people tell me, the Lord didn't say music counted. You know what? He didn't mention it. He just didn't mention it. Well, they had an Old Testament worship. Now you're measuring apples and oranges because they didn't have anything like that. Those, that music was different. They didn't have, they had a lot of things in the Old Testament, by the way. David had many wives. Are we going to say that was in the Old Testament too? Are we going to start offering animal sacrifices? Are we going to have incense? Why don't we just do what God says do? It's so simple. It's hard to miss. And with doing that, you can see that it's not, it's something so easy that these young Christians or young people that know the difference would know the difference. But you're being told different things. I want to show you tonight a little bit more specific application of what our young people are facing. But what I do know is this. When you read the Bible, if you're not careful, someone's going to steal your blessing and say, well, God didn't mean that. I have a feeling that God meant it. Now, why? I don't necessarily know, but I just know in the Bible when God was serious about telling people what to do, he made a covenant. You do what, you, what I'm telling you to do, and I'm going to be faithful, and I will bless you. I don't read of Noah saying, well, you know, I don't really like gopher wood. Can I use some cedar? Love to have some pine in there. Wouldn't that be nice? Well, I could add anything I want to it. Don't like the Lord's Supper. We've developed a... a Pattern of using pizza. I like pizza. We'd probably get a better crowd if we had pizza. That's not what he said. It's just so easy to understand. And Paul is saying to this church, he is saying, there is spiritual Israel. Who is spiritual Israel? Those people who act by faith in accordance with God's will. He blesses them. And he'll have more to say, talk about that in future weeks. But God bless us as we serve him. We're not God, He is. And this morning, if you need to come to Christ and we can help you in any way, either become a Christian or in your daily walk, if you need prayers of your brothers and sisters in Christ, would you come while we stand and while we sing?